Liz Wheeler, host of The Liz Wheeler Show, a podcast which you can go get and should get wherever you get your audio entertainment. We were just talking about the transition from cable to podcast. And you told me, hey, it's taken a minute to sort of shed the formality of cable news. Can I just tell you, Liz, I feel like I do this show three times a week. And I always – it's – it's weird. Like, I remind myself, be authentic, be yourself, and that's not hard, except you go to TV, and you're right. It's more like putting on a tuxedo. And then you yes. go to – I used to do a radio show on ESPN, and it's more like putting on a dirty T-shirt and hanging out with your buddies and drinking <laughs> a beer and talking sports. And then you do a podcast, and you're alone often, and you're talking into a microphone, and it's, like, hermetically sealed, and I'm somewhere between casual – informal but that that what you just described is that transition from cable to podcast it takes a minute it's like it's like changing your wardrobe oh it, it totally is when i first transitioned from cable news to podcasting my business partner who's my executive producer was like you know you're gonna have to drop some of your old cable news habits one of the biggest differences between cable news and podcasting is that in podcasting your audience wants to hear your thought process. They want to hear how you are intaking and thinking about and then outputting information. And I was like, okay, I'm a pro. I can do this. And he's like, no, no, it's opposite of cable news because we strive so hard in cable news to present the conclusion and hide in this beautifully packaged presentation um, hide the actual process, the nitty gritty. And both are great. I mean, my roots are in cable news. I love it. Podcasting is super fun. It is, a, it is different. It is different to be like, let me tell you how I think about this versus just making a formal argument for your conclusion. Exactly. That's a great way to put it. The only advantage that I have is that my cable, my primary cable residence is Fox and Friends, which is about the least formal you can get <laughs> when it comes to yeah. cable news. So we are encouraged, by the way, and I do love that about Fox and Friends, of sort of think our way through it live on television, where what you were doing, what Tucker Carlson does, what I do when I fill in for Tucker Carlson is more of a finished product, more of a let me make the case. Let me let me reveal to you this argument, and it is polished, and you hope that it is perfect even though you do it five nights a week. Yeah, the way that I that I think about it sometimes is that a cable news monologue – is like an argument in front of the Supreme Court where you have put so many documents into the preparation of this, so many hours of practice into crafting every word to hit just perfectly. Whereas a podcast, you have the same goal, but the podcast is like the conference room of all the lawyers who are like sweating and downing coffee and, and deciding amongst themselves, arguing amongst themselves, which is the best way to argue this. And that's what viewers get with a podcast is they get to see this as it comes to life. And both are great. There's an necessity for both, but, um, it, it, it's a little bit, I guess, how the sausage is made versus the finished product, right? I think so. I think that's right. And I think there's some authenticity of letting people behind the curtain into the, into the factory to see the process of making the sausage. I want to talk to you um, about where your thought process is, and you can sound it out loud with me if you want, seeing how this is a podcast. But um, <laughs> you have been on OAN, you have been a commentator on big stages within the conservative movement. You recently had up on your Twitter page who should be the next chairperson of the uh, Republican National Committee. And I think it's all leading towards this one bigger question. What, how do you see the future of conservatism? I don't know that any one individual, maybe in your estimation, one individual does. I don't know that one individual defines the future, but I'd love to hear who that might be or how you might describe the future of conservatism. Yeah, this I mean, this is the million dollar question, right? Not just who are you going to support in 2024, but who are we going to orient our party around? Whose philosophy? And I got to tell you, I am like the least fangirl type of person. I just don't have that sort of elevate someone to a pedestal bone in my body at all. So I, I personally find all politicians really annoying. I hate all politicians on both sides of the aisle. Some of them serve my um, interests in the sense that they're the ones that are that are supporting or advocating for policies that I agree with. And so I support them because they're fighting the fight that I want them to fight. But I think it's a mistake for the Republican Party to orient themselves around any individual now or in the past. I mean, we've done this not not just now. I'm not just talking about our current our, our, our current era. We've done this in the past and it is a mistake. What we need to do as a Republican Party right now is step away from the 2020 midterms and 
ask ourselves the question, how did we win public opinion, which we did, and couple that with the dissatisfaction that so many people feel about Joe Biden being president? How does that combination marry with the lack of red wave that we saw? And the answer to that question leads us to examining the procedures of election, our apparatus, which is the responsibility of the RNC. As you mentioned, I talked about this on my show yesterday um, and and looking at ways that we can make elections as secure and as fair as possible through the procedures that are implemented by the states. You know, I don't disagree with you. I think you have to look at, okay. It appeared going into the midterm elections that there was an enthusiasm that would lead to a certain outcome and a rejection that would lead to a certain outcome. Both of them, you would think, leading to that that proverbial red wave. It didn't turn out that way. Um, I do think there are lessons to learn about the procedure, about potential ballot harvesting, the how aggressive Democrats have been in adapting to and helping to shape the new world of voting that began really with COVID, where such a big percentage of our voting process moved to mail-in balloting. But I want to ask you, is there any other self-reflection you come out of those midterms? Was it a rejection of America first? Was it a rejection of Donald Trump? Was it a rejection of those each individual candidates, whether or not they be Dr. Oz or Carrie Lake? Is there anything in your mind beyond procedure to learn from the midterms? Well, I think that Donald Trump is neither responsible nor to blame for any of the any of the outcomes of of the midterms. I know that people on the right, including including Trump himself, want to take credit for victories. And I know that people on the left want to blame Trump for losses. I actually don't think that he was the primary influence in this in this election. I think, of course, we did. I mean, I hate to say this. Um, I think Mitch McConnell was correct when he said a couple months ago that some of this, the candidates that we ran for Senate were not the best candidates. It was unwise of McConnell to say that then because that that causes people, voters not to turn out as much. It stifles enthusiasm. But he wasn't incorrect. I mean, Dr. Oz was a terrible candidate, objectively, barely a Republican, if that couldn't even beat John Fetterman. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that the two biggest less or the two biggest takeaways that I had were that the cultural issues that so often the establishment Republicans are afraid or uncomfortable to talk about critical race theory, queer theory, parental rights, school choice, um, all of those different things actually are, are a bi- have bipartisan agreement among voters. We should talk about the uncomfortable issues and not just be an, an economic Republican party, if you will, jobs and taxes and national security. Um, that's one of the biggest takeaways. And the other one is, is procedure. I mean, we have to be, we have to be solid on these election procedures. You know, when I ask you that question, the reason I ask that question is, and this, I don't know, I, you know, I think about myself and I, I probably do way too much self-reflection, Liz, but I think that, I think when I am most unhappy in life is when I feel a sense of lack of control, you know, personally, professionally, whatever mm-hmm. that may be. I know that control, I'm happy to fail if I control the outcome. And, you know, in looking at, if you kind of extrapolate that into politics or whatever aspect of life, you know, I've failed at business, Liz, I've, I've failed in sports. And afterwards I want to say, okay, what could I have done better? Not just because it, you know, I want to win, which I do want to win, but because I want to reestablish control. I know that if I can fix the things I can fix, then I can, I can at least grab some of the steering wheel of control. But there's another reason I ask you that question. And that is, I just find that we're in such a weird moment in history where we have been for probably at least five years where I don't know what it means to be far left. I don't know what it means to be far right. You know, I'm going to tell you a quick story. So there was this guy that called me the other day and he's a, he's a very high profile news sports figure. And he said to me, Hey, Will, it can't be that it's always just the left that is wrong. Like, a referee would have to acknowledge flags need to fly on both sides of the teams. It doesn't mean it needs to be 50-50, but it can't possibly be 100-0. And he said to me, um, and, and he was saying this to me and explaining this outcome, and I said, hey, but here's the deal. I don't accept the old school political spectrum. I just don't see it that way anymore. What used to be far left or left and what used to be right or far right doesn't make sense to me in a world where there's free speech censorship and forced vaccines. It just none of it could have made sense 10 years ago, right? Even the trans stuff, as you mentioned, none of that fit 
into the way we thought about political ideology 10 years ago. And so I think, okay, well, how do we fit into the future? You know, I do believe in an America first philosophy, foreign policy, um, economics, when it comes to blue collar, working class workers, middle class workers here in the United States of America. But I think that we all, anybody who has some sense of, I want to get control of how this country can win in the future needs to come together and decide, well, what does winning look like? And that's why I turn to you. What do you want? When I ask you, what do you want the future of conservatism to look like? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that this is, you're going to have to indulge me the philosophical meandering here, but I think that we have to, as a conservative movement, we have to understand the difference between what our party has tended towards the last couple decades, which is libertarianism, this John Lockean philosophy of liberty where individual liberties are, are at the, at the tip of the pyramid. They are the highest, the highest, um, the highest thing to achieve or the highest goal where this idea that you can do whatever you want on your property, as long as you aren't violating my, my fundamental human right. We've tried that as a conservative movement and a Republican party for the last couple decades to be perfectly transparent. I even, I guess, tend towards, I wish I could embrace that viewpoint because I like the idea of that viewpoint, but we right now as a Republican party have to grapple with the idea that while our declaration of independence is rooted in John Lockean philosophy, this libertarianism, this individual rights. Our Constitution is actually not rooted in the same philosophy. Our Constitution is rooted in Edmund Burkean philosophy, which is not just pure liberty, which is also license. It's rooted in ordered liberty. Ordered liberty, meaning we're not going to try to create in our states a completely morally neutral playing field where you just remove all essence of right and wrong from state laws and and have this it's really an artificial idea of neutrality but instead ordered liberty acknowledges that there are right and wrong objective truth good and bad and that this it's it's first principles right uh, acknowledges that first principles exist that we are that we as human beings are naturally ordered by this creator in in this way to achieve good and bad to have this choice and the Republican Party has a hard time latching on to the Edmund Burkean idea of ordered liberty because it comes with the idea that, yes, we will be putting some morality into state law. But that's where I would like the conservative movement and the Republican Party to go and to embrace, because that is the way to protect the longevity of our nation. As John Adams okay, so- said a long time ago, our nation is for our moral people and no other. So this is fascinating. I want to I want to dig in on this if we can for a moment. I think I'm hearing you correctly when you say state over and over. So what tell me what if I'm interpreting what you have to say correctly, your view of federalism at the what your view of the federal government is um, Lockean. In other words, the, the the United States of America and the laws that it adopts and it's capable of adopting constitutionally should reflect and again, I'm, I'm putting some words in your mouth here, but I think I'm hearing you correctly. A Lockean viewpoint. It would be ordered liberty with individual liberty at the top of the pyramid. OK, I see you shaking your head. But where I was going to go with that, as at the state levels, those little laboratories of democracy, you could implement a more Burkean vision, meaning now you now you can put individual liberties below the collective sense of morality. So. And I'm not endorsing and I don't even know yet what morality laws you're talking about. But I just want to make sure from a from a um, let me give you an example so that people don't think I'm talking about a theocracy here because I'm certainly not talking about a theocracy. And I, I, I think generally what you're saying is, yes, the only thing that I would change is it's not that individual liberties are put on a lower totem pole. It's that the family unit is thought of as the highest thing. Right. That all law is created so that the family unit can thrive, because without the family unit being the primary source of dependence, meaning that you and I rely on spouses and our children rely on us and, you know, children and adult children take care of their parents. Without that, we can't have a limited federal government because people have to rely on something. So when I'm talking about morality at the state level, I'm talking about parental parental involvement in curriculum choices that parents in Florida is a perfect example of this actually, with their parental rights and education bill, um, where parents said, listen, we are going to acknowledge, we're going to establish in our state that it is wrong, 
it is inappropriate for kindergartners, first graders, second graders, and third graders to be indoctrinated in a public school system with sexually explicit material. That will is is actually an acknowledgement of their of putting something that is a moral question on the table and having the state govern according to that idea of morality. That is that's appropriate. That's Edmund Burkean and states have an absolute right. They actually should be governing according to according to that philosophy. OK, I, and I understand and. I agree. Was I correct in in characterizing your point of view as distinguishing between the federal and the state government levels? So, like you said, you yes. don't want to uh, lead anybody to the path of believing that you're in support of a theocracy. But here's a good practical <laughs> example. Here's a good practical example of that. When when um, the Supreme Court struck down um, Roe v. Wade and returned the question democratically to the states, the states then had a choice. They have a choice to to make that moral decision 50 times over right but and i i would assume i would assume that's something that you you support um but would you support a federal law several several i believe republican senators talked about this would you then support a federal law that criminalized abortion that that that's where i'm curious where i'm i'm trying to see where you are on state versus federal and i think that might be a good a good example to help highlight the issue Yeah, that's a really nuanced one. And it's kind of like homicide laws, putting abortion aside for a second. There are state laws against homicide and then there are federal laws against homicide. Right. So there is there is some federal power that that the federal government has or some power the federal government has to to regulate violations to constitutionally protected rights. I would argue that abortion is one of those. I would argue that. We know from science, regardless of your religious beliefs, we know science says life begins at the moment of conception. So I'm not sure what right we as 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 a culture, we as a people, we can't look at this through a populist viewpoint. I'm not sure what right we have to simply pick and choose that this demographic of people, which we know scientifically are people just because of their location in their mother's womb. They are somehow deprived of the protection of the life, which is guaranteed to be protected by um, right. by our federal laws. At the same time, states can also states can also um, enact policies that are different from the federal government's, maybe harsher penalties sometimes, maybe lesser penalties at the state level. Um, there's overlap between between state and federal, but mostly it falls on states to govern issues where a people is saying we want to acknowledge this is morality and order the liberty in our state um, along those lines with the acknowledgement of first principles. Yeah, that's a, um, that's, I, I don't, you know, I think that when you first come out of the gates with that, it sounds more controversial than it, than it actually, than it actually is and, and that it actually might be. Yeah. You know, I, I've been somebody who in the past would have described themselves as very libertarian. I, I don't do so, so much anymore. I still hold individual rights in the highest of regard. Um, but my my inherent tension with that, Liz, and this isn't exclusive. This doesn't say laws aren't ever appropriate because you point out I like the way Florida's handled some of these morality issues. Mm. But culturally, we need to begin to understand, obviously, the value of morality, but also of communitarianism. Like, I don't want laws that require you to give up you know, increasing amounts of income to your local governing body. But I do want a community that has a sense shared of values and spirit of helping each other. I come from a small town in Texas, you know, and I think that we have adopted this very cosmopolitan, you know, monolithic view of what it is to be an American. And in, and in that we've lost our provincialism, which was good. And inside of that provincialism was communitarianism where I don't want to be an isolated atom within my town. You know, I want to know my neighbor. I want to know people at my church. I want to know people downtown when you go to the bank. And I want everybody to help each other when someone's grieving or going to a funeral. And that's a cultural sense that I feel like is has been lost and in almost, in a way, sacrificed at the altar, at least in part of, well, it's all about me and my individualism. Yeah, yeah I think I think you're correct. I think that... I, I, too, tend towards I want to tend towards libertarianism. And I did in the past. But I I just don't think that I mean, we've tried this. Like I said before, we've tried this for the past couple of decades and it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And 
we've seen the results when you put this individualism, not just legally, but culturally into practice, that it is degrading to the sense of community. I agree with you. When you when you have a sense of community, people helping each other, people who know each other, you you recognize people's humanity in a way that's that's yes. lost when when it's just keyboard warriors right when you're just thinking of people as the opposition and that also what you're talking about is so important because that sense of community when people rely on their churches and their their clubs and their their i guess their schools or back before the public school system was the way it is now at least it, it it allows us to not be dependent on the federal government to not look to government to take care of us first but to look to each other that's a very healthy very american thing Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I think, you know, I think when, when I one of the best images of American I can think of, and, and it's not that it's exclusively American, but I mean, you ever been in a small town when someone dies and the way that everybody in that town shows up at the person's house with a plate of food, you know, with to ensure that the family doesn't have to cook a meal for going on almost a month. You know, this is what I'm afraid is lost through the prism of staring at this all day long. Living in this virtual world, seeking your own individual ambition when being a valuable member of your community is of the highest value, highest value, more so than your bank account or your, your, I don't know, satisfying your ambition. Um, before I lose time with you here, Liz, you have been really, really outspoken and active when it comes to COVID. You've been, um, I believe, Censored on occasion. You've certainly been fact checked. <laughs> and here we are. And uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci is uh, has just completed something like a seven hour deposition where in part we learned that his daughter worked at Twitter. Wow. Um, when you see do you have ho- how about this question? Do you have hope that there will ever be a full accountability and a revelation of the truth when it comes to covid? Um, I would have to divide that question into two parts. Do I have hope that there will be political accountability for Dr. Fauci? Probably not. I don't have that much faith in in the Republicans in Congress to hold him to account. You'd have to do a very serious untangling of big pharma with these these government, these executive agencies like the CDC, the FDA, the NIH. They are To say that they're in bed with each other is the understatement of the year. So there would have to be just full, for lack of a better term here, draining of the swamp, not just getting rid of individuals like Fauci, but untangling um, how they've been meshed together. I don't think right now we're at the place that that's realistic. This Congress is not going to be able to do it. But do I think that the American people have had their eyes opened? People who may have looked at the CDC and said, oh, if the CDC says it like that's that that's the expert, that's the authority or, you know, what my pediatrician told me about, you know, my child, like I listen to them. They know. I think the American people's eyes have been open to the fact that the so-called experts aren't the experts. They are ideologues. They are corrupted by by politics. And that's maybe just as powerful as untangling the political corruption. You can't have elitists that control people if people refuse to be controlled. So on one sense, yes, we're there on an, on the governmental sense. We still have some work to do. I, yeah, and we still have some work to do on on the revelation of the truth. I think you're right that credibility yeah. on their own account has been has been burned um, at every level of the medical and pharmaceutical establishment. But we still have a lot of truth yet to uncover. We do. We do. And all of those fact checks that you mentioned, the the demonetizing. Yeah. Listen, I don't take this personally. I don't I don't care if YouTube, you know, suspends me or kicks me off. It's not like YouTube is saying, hey, listen, Liz Wheeler, we want to put a muzzle on you. No, I care about this because what they're doing is by putting a muzzle on me, they're preventing everyone else from hearing that information. That's the part that infuriates me, not the fact that I've been suspended. Like it was just a matter of time. OK, whatever. <laughs> I always flirted with the edges of their of their terms of service. And that's fine. But all of these fact checkers, I would I would ask, I would challenge now. What are we two years later, almost three years later? Prove me wrong, because all of those fact checks that you issued, I've been proven right. I was the one that was looking at the data and listening to the science and the data and the empirical evidence and not being polluted, not having my my um, my opinions pollute or my critiques of the public health establishment polluted by ideology and by financial interests here. So we have a lot of work to do to untangle 
Um, to untangle what the NIH gave to Wuhan, what the Chinese knew, what our government suppressed. I, I, I hope I'm proved wrong here, Will. I hope the Republicans that take over the majority in the House of Representatives, I hope they have this fire in their belly to fight this fight and untangle this and show us what we need to show. Um, I hope I, I hope I'm not being too much of a skeptic here when I'm saying, well, well, given their track record, we'll see. I hope that I that I come on your show again and say, listen, Will, I was totally wrong. They were awesome. I have more hope in Elon Musk at this point. I hope that Twitter files two or three. <laughs> Me too. I hope that Twitter files two or the three reveal the government induced censorship when it came to COVID. And then we, we can learn from that exactly what took place, not just at Twitter, but at Google, at YouTube, at Facebook and all the other places as well. But for now, it's free. So you should go listen to it. I mean, it is not muzzled. It's the Liz Wheeler show. Uh, check out that podcast. I'm sure wherever you can get your audio entertainment, Liz, Apple, Spotify and everywhere else that offers up podcasts. You're exactly right. You can go to LizWheelerShow.com and you can find where to watch it. Thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate it. It was great to have you. Thank you, Liz. Hey, it's Will Kane. Click here to subscribe to the Fox News channel on YouTube. It's the best way to get our latest interviews and highlights. And click to subscribe to the Will Kane podcast for full episodes right now.